Let's take a look at a high voltage trigger transformer for a xenon strobe tube. And the reason I got these transformers, I got a couple of packs of them, is because I wanted to experiment with uh, using them for other high voltage purposes. And I'm always, well, I've always been impressed by the fact that these tiny little things can put out, well, in the case of this one, it can put out about 6,000 volts. But look at the size of it. It doesn't look like it could handle that, but that's what it's rated. So its physical size is about 7 millimeters diameter and 10 millimeters long. That's about 0.3 inch diameter and 0.4, in, uh, 0.4 of an inch long. And the data sheet for it suggests that it has a winding ratio. It's got 20.5 turns. So this isn't like a transformer that you could just power up straight off the mains or anything like that. You have to actually pulse this by discharge a capacitor through it. Uh, but the primary only has 20.5 turns, very low resistance, but the secondary has 480 turns. So this is also rated for an input voltage of 250 volts uh, and an output voltage of 6 kV. Let's do the maths. Let's bring in the kink calculation, do a little sum here. So the winding ratio is 480 divided by 20.5. So that's the secondary divided by the primary equals a winding ratio of about 23.4. And with that 250 volts times 250 volts, it would step up to uh, 5.8 thousand volts. So that's uh, pretty close to their 6,000 volt rating. OK, that's uh, good. That's interesting. But what I'm going to do is I shall show you the schematic of typically how you'd use these. And then I will unwind it. I want to examine it closely and see how they get such a high voltage rating in such a small space. So here's a typical circuit using one of these. You would have a diode and a current limiting resistor and it would charge up a capacitor that can either be put in parallel of the call or in uh, series like this. My preferred approach is to put it in series. Sometimes they'll put it in like in line with the uh, thyristor, but I prefer this approach. And what happens is that gradually that capacitor will be charged up to quite a high voltage via this coil. Because it happens at sort of low current, it doesn't really induce much across in this coil. But when it reaches the desired voltage, uh, this thyristor can be fired. And when it shunts the capacitor and the coil through the thyristor, it causes a really high pulse of current in the primary, which then gets coupled across the secondary and creates a very high voltage. In the case of a xenon strobe tube, you have a quartz tube with the electrodes and then the xenon fill. And you can apply, well, typically they do apply about 350 volts across those tubes, but it won't actually strike. It's just basically across a big capacitor or in big industrial sort of and fairground strobes, it's across the mains with a little bit of extra circuitry. But to actually trigger them, there's an outer electrode, and sometimes that's a conductive coating on the outside of the tube, especially little thin straight tubes. On other ones, it's a wire that is physically wound around the tube, or a series of loops and knotted at one side by a machine. And when you apply that uh, high voltage pulse to it, it ionises the gas from one end to the other inside the tube. And if you configure the circuitry incorrectly, you can actually, if you have or you have a, a different supply, or you trigger it off phase. Uh, the time I've seen this, I was triggering it deliberately off phase just to see what happened uh, with an industrial strobe. But you can actually see a ghostly blue glow uh, along there of the xenon glowing. But if it is in phase, then it uh, basically creates an ionized path from one to uh, end to the other. And the tube will then fire and it'll discharge the capacitor until the voltage is low enough it goes out. That's how the traditional xenon strobes, like say for instance the stroboscopes at nightclubs or the strobes in the uh, the little egg strobes you get, like lamps that just pulse every so often, or the, the industrial warning strobes. But let's close up a little bit here. Let's get into this. And I shall unwind one of these. So to do this, I'm going to zoom in a bit and focus on this. And I'm going to bring a knife. And the first thing I'm going to do is remove the outer layer of foil. So the connections in this, this is the common connection, this wire here. This is the trigger connection. 
And uh, this is the high voltage output connection. So if I pop this blade out and I gently lift this tape, I should be able to undo it. Silence as I, I basically concentrate on what I'm doing here. I've let go of it. It's everywhere now. I wondered if these would be potted. Oh, that's interesting. So that, what you're seeing there, um, right, that's different to the one I took apart before. I took one of the green ones apart to compare them. And it was windings from one end to the other. This is a much shorter set of windings. Right, tell you what. And it looks as though it has been coated in some way. Right, tell you what, that's a... Uh, this uh, wire is... I'll, I'll draw this out afterwards to show you. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight... 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. That's different from the data sheet. Uh, and then, it's, uh, if it's ending like the other one, it will disappear down the outside from the edge here, down to this middle connection. Okay, let's uh, snap that off. It's quite a short piece of wire. Now let's go in here. This feels like they have impregnated it with wax. That's interesting. Right, let's see if I can get the next layer off. Is it wax or resin? It feels waxy. That would make sense. Much easier. Let's see if I can get the next layer off, and then I'll, I'll count at least one layer. But as the layers, I'll count the number of turns in one layer, and then I'll count, I'll pause momentarily, and I'll count the actual number of layers. So here's the next piece of tape coming off, and this will be the secondary. This will be the high voltage winding. That is wax. Interesting. So here's the high voltage winding, covered in wax. Um, and it looks as though... Oh, I'm going to have to find the end of this. I think it's going down there. I'm going to have to look at this through a magnifying glass because it is tiny. Okay, I can see the winding. Right, tell you what, I'm going to try and... Fish this winding out here. I'm going to break it, in fact, because I'm going to be unwinding it after all. It's very, very small and fiddly. I don't want to damage the other winds because I want to actually count this. Okay, that's me got one end. So let's count uh, from one end to the other. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm going to pause for this. One moment, please. Okay, that was 55 turns along to the end there. Now I'm going to actually unwind the whole thing, but actually count the number of layers. So I will pause momentarily, and once I've got right down to the middle, I'll do a doodle, and then once I come back, I'll, I'll show you that doodle. One moment, please. Well, that's me taking a few of them apart now. I'm glad I got two packets. And it's been very interesting. They're both based on a very similar former with a ferric core through the middle with the leads physically resined into the end of that, I guess, ultimately. Because there's basically about six to 10,000 volts across this ferrite, it makes you realise how, how high the dielectric strength of ferrite is. I wonder what it is, the particular the blend. But they have these little bobbins, and I'll show you in a moment the uh, the winding arrangement. But the bobbins have a little slit at on both sides. It's not really used on this side, but it is used on that side. Once they've wound these, they seem to apply a drop of resin on each end and let it just sit down and set. But then they seem to marinate them in wax. And this is so old-fashioned. If I zoom down a little bit here, you can actually maybe catch the slight jaggedy outline here where the wax has gone right through the windings and into the middle. And wax has always been used. It's very traditional uh, in transformers. If I was looking at a typical potted high voltage transformer, I'd, I'd typically expect to see it vacuum potted in resin. I think the main advantage of wax is that it's basically self-penetrating. It just white weasels its way. It's, very, it's got a very good creeping ability. So if they actually dip these in hot wax, it's going to sneak right in and get into the, in amongst all the windings.
Uh, I shall show you a picture of the layout of these. So here's a rough cross-sectional area of this core. Let me just zoom down onto this. Here's the ferrite core in the middle. There's the plastic bobbin moulded around it. And the slot down here, they start by uh, attaching one of the very fine wires. Now, my calipers do not go low enough. I, the best I could get was the outer core a 0.2 millimetre and the inner core 0.1. It really needs to be accurate to a hundredth of a millimetre to get the size of this wire. It's very, very fine. But they start here on the high voltage terminal. Let's put a little, let's put a little lightning bolt there because that's the high voltage terminal. And they start with the very fine winding going the inside and then they wind it very evenly along. And then they jump up a layer and then they wind it back the way and up a layer back the way. So, but if they wound it very roughly on it, it there'd be quite high voltage between the layers. But because it's la layered in very distinct layers, very close together, it must be done for a fairly accurate machine. It means that although it's only it's 6,000 volts across the output between this and this, which is the other end of that winding, it's spread over the layers of windings. So there's only about 666 volts, or in the case of the other one, it, it had less layers. It had about, the white one had nine layers, the green one had seven and a half, so say eight. So it'll be slightly higher, but it's still, you know, it means that you're not going to get that massive output voltage across just a layer of insulation in the wire. So they create this uh, zigzag backwards and forwards with the uh, the high voltage winding, the secondary, and then at the end, it just ducks over the outside of the bobbin and goes on to the common connection. The common connection also has the uh, much coarser uh, primary winding, which starts off on the common connection, winds very coarsely in just a single layer from one end to the other, and then folds back, and that is actually the wire that comes straight out of this. It's not connected to anything. That wire there that you're seeing coming off here is the uh, end of that winding. It's very straightforward. Odd that the white had about 13 turns, where the green had 20.5. But the, when you added up the turns, it was 55 turns times 9, so it came up to 495. The uh, green one was 65 times seven and sets, and plus a half uh, wound section uh, of 38, and it came up to 493, so say about 495 turns for both those. I'm trying to remember what the data sheet said. 480 turns, that's not bad. It's like 10 turns off or 15 turns off. Uh, and that is it. The other things worthy of note, the... One of the data sheets said 200 nano, 220 nanofarad for the capacitor that discharges through the coarse uh, primary winding. But others, which actually seemed more accurate to me, were 22 nanofarad to 47 nanofarad. It's charged up to about uh, 200 or so volts. Uh, in the case of discharging it direct, direct off the mains, it would be about 330. But they do, it's designed for a primary voltage of about 250 volts. Uh, but the uh, that, with that little capacitor, will still, when it's discharged suddenly, it will generate enough of a magnetic field with those uh, that sort of fairly coarse winding to actually induce the high voltage in the, in the sort of the, the finer windings. So that's the construction of it. It's very odd, very strange that they can jam such a high voltage and pretty reliably uh, into such a small space. So I'm going to be doing some experiments with these. I'm going to be using them with a SIDAC. The difference in the schematic for the SIDAC, let me just pull this back. The difference is that with the SIDAC, a SIDAC is a diode which triggers at a specific voltage. This is what they look like. These ones are quite big. And it's symbol. Instead of using the thyristor, I'm going to use the SIDAC, which, uh, let me think, it's this is the symbol. And you get them for different voltage ratings. And say, for instance, the 200 volt one, uh, as soon as the voltage across this capacitor and winding reaches 200 volts, that will switch on itself. It will just shunt the uh, thing and it'll, as soon as it reaches a sort of lower voltage level, it'll reset. So this uh, basically will be able to fire like 50, 100 uh, or 60, 120 times a second, depending on how it's configured. Um, but it's uh, 
It's interesting. This is for future experiments. I've never really taken one of these before, apart before. It was well worth doing. It was interesting seeing how they wind them and the layers of wax that they impregnate into it. Um, but very neat. A very interesting way of getting just that small uh, spike of high voltage at low current.